Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Brandon, and today I want to talk to you about a Windows privilege escalation methodology that really helped me when I was going through the OSCP. Now, I did make a very similar video to this on Linux privilege escalation, so if you haven't seen that, I should have a card popping up now. You can go ahead and check that out. But I actually made another mind map to help with Windows privilege escalation, similar to the Linux one, and it's in the same exact repository. So this link will be down below in the description. I highly recommend going to check it out. Uh, so basically, if we scroll down past the Linux privilege escalation mind map, you'll see that I now added a Windows privilege escalation mind map. So the, the thought behind this is that really after you're hitting like the 12 hour mark in your exam, your brain is probably going to be fried and you're going to be missing some really simple things. And it happens to all of us, right? I mean, we're all human and uh, that's just the nature of the game. Your, your brain can only function at that capacity for so long before it starts to get really hard to think through these things. So I'm not going to be talking about the specifics of like commands to run and things like that. There are a million guides out there online you can find that will show you all the commands. This is going to be like the thought process and the methodology behind Windows privilege escalation. So I'll put some links below in the description as well to some helpful guides that have a lot of commands and things like that to run, which you can use to cross reference with this chart to get some local privilege escalation going. Now, an important thing to note is that these attacks have nothing to do with Active Directory. These are strictly local privilege escalation on Windows. So again, I've broken this up into three categories that we can think about with credentialed access, exploits, and misconfigurations. So let's start out with credential access. Now, the thought behind this is essentially we want to find credentials stored somewhere that can be used to, you know, maybe escalate to a different account, right? So maybe find passwords to an administrative account, or we can do something with the credentials we already have. Now, the biggest thing here and the most simple one is reused passwords again, because if you already have some sort of credentials, see if maybe there's a lazy administrator in place and those credentials work for another account too. I mean, that's one of the most basic things to check for. And I've burned myself a lot of times so by not checking for that right off the bat. Now, there's a lot of places we can look for new credentials, including configuration files. So if there's any services that are running, check all the configuration files that you can read and see if you can find credentials from there. If you find that there's a local database running, like you know uh, Microsoft SQL Server or anything like that, go ahead and see if you can log into that database and extract credentials that way. Sometimes you can find hashes there or maybe even plain text credentials to an administrative account, and there you go, there's your privilege escalation. Now, another thing that's kind of exclusive to Windows, and it's a little bit different, different from Linux, is that you can have credentials stored in command key. So typically you would just do command key slash list, and these would be saved credentials that could be used uh, to execute specific commands or sometimes any command. So definitely worth checking that out. It's kind of similar to sudo access in Linux. Not really the same, but you can kind of think of it in the same kind of way. Now, another place to look for credentials, which is fairly common, is to find them in the registry files. So you can find commands that will just go through query a bunch of places in the registry for plain text credentials. And we can also find credentials in the unattend.xml or sysprep files. So these files are used for automatic installs of Windows. So sometimes you'll find like credentials for auto logon in there or, you know, all sorts of plain text credentials that could be in there. Those files have a few different places you can look to find them, but I'm sure you can find all those locations in the guides I'll put below in the description as well. Now, another great place to check for credentials are log files. So, you know, maybe it has an authentication log. You can see usernames and passwords of accounts that are trying to log into some sort of service. That's another great place to look. And finally, it doesn't have to do necessarily with getting credentials, but I, I put it under this category because I thought it made the most sense. Uh, but take a look at what groups your user is a part of, right? Because depending on the groups that you're in, you might be able to find some shared resources with another user. So this can help when you're trying to prove ask from one user to another, or maybe you're in same groups uh, as some administrative user, and you can you know use those shared resources to find credentials or things like that in different files. Now, moving on to exploit. Uh, again, it's kind of ironic that exploit is the smallest category here because a lot of people think, you know, oh, well, hacking is all about exploiting stuff, but not necessarily, right? Because a lot of times your uh, initial foothold will be from some sort of exploit in a CVE, but for privilege escalation, it's usually not the case, although I have seen it a lot of times, but there's usually other things you can find that will help you more. But it's definitely worth looking into services that are running just on localhost, right? Or maybe some sort of uh, other adapter that you didn't have access to before. So once you get that initial shell in the box, take a look at all the services that are running that you might not have seen from the outside and check the versions of them, right? Because there could be all sorts of CVEs there. Again, we want to be checking for kernel version as well. Same thing on Linux. On Windows, you want to check for kernel version and see if you can find any kernel exploits. 
Now, again, for any software or services that we find on the box, make sure to do some looking into them. What versions of software or services are running? Because if those, uh, if that software or that service is running as a high privileged account, and there's some sort of remote code execution (RCE) or maybe a local privilege escalation um, (CVE), then that can typically lead to privilege escalation because we are able to exploit those services and get some sort of code to be executed as an administrative user. So moving on to the largest section here, and that is misconfigurations. Now, this is where you're going to find a lot of your privilege escalation stuff. Um, there are so many different things that can be misconfigured, and it's probably the most common thing to see, but it's also one of the most tricky things to identify because it's not as simple as just Googling a service version or things like that to get an exploit to work. Now, one of the big things in Windows is the privileges that are assigned to your user. So if you get a shell as a user and you just do like a who am I slash privs or who am I, who am I slash all, you should see all of the privileges that are assigned to your user. And there are a lot of these that can lead to privilege escalation. You can find charts online which show you how to abuse specific permissions to gain administrative access. Again, I'll, I'll have that below in the description for you to look at. But some that come to mind are like SE impersonate token or uh, SE backup privilege. I think those are the correct names. But you know, there's all sorts of ones that you can use, uh, all sorts of privileges that can be assigned to a user that you can abuse for privilege escalation. Now, one of the biggest categories in misconfigurations, and one of the things that you'll find privilege es escalation in a lot of the times is services that are running on the machine. So there's a, a lot of different things that can go wrong with services that are running. Now, of course, these services need to be running as some sort of administrative user or system or, you know, any user that you want to privest to. If it's running as a low privilege user, it doesn't really make sense to abuse the service because if you do abuse it, you'll only get code execution as the user the service is running as. Now, there's a great tool that you can use to do some enumeration of services called PowerUp. I'll, again, I'll link that below in the description. I believe it is okay to use for the OSCP as an enumeration tool. I would not use the auto exploit features of it because, uh, you know, that could lead to some problems with breaking the rules of the exam. But again, I am not affiliated with offensive security in any way. I can't speak to what is and what is not allowed on the exam. So, you know, I do recommend looking into power up and using that as an enumeration tool. But again, I can't make that call of whether that's okay on the exam or not. If you have any questions about that stuff, I'd highly recommend just reaching out to offensive security support and asking them yourself. But, you know, some of the things we should look at with services, for example, are unquoted service paths, right? So if you find a service that's running a system or an administrative user, it will be executing some sort of binary or executable as the service, right? And it will have to specify the full path of that service in the actual service definition, right? So the, the full path to that executable file. Now, if, if that executable file contains spaces in its path and there aren't quotes surrounding it, there are some ways that you can abuse that to kind of hijack the service path and get some code execution working off of the service that way. So another fairly common thing to see uh, in a way to abuse services is being able to change the service binary location, right? So each service is going to have a specific attribute where it specifies the path to where the binary or executable that is the service is located, right? So if the service is misconfigured, you might be able to change where that uh, path points to. So you could just say, instead of it executing the real service, like the real executable it's supposed to, you could point it to like C slash temp slash, you know, your reverse shell dot exe. And then once that service gets restarted, you'll get a reverse shell on there, right? So um, another thing to look at is, are you able to overwrite the service binary itself? So you might not be able to actually change the path or the location of the service, but do you have full control over the folder where the service is held, right? Can you actually go to that folder where the binary is and overwrite it with something that's malicious, right? So it could be a reverse shell or a uh, payload to just add a new ad admin user to the box or things like that, right? So you got to get a little creative with it. Maybe you can just rename uh, the binary and move it to a different location, put your malicious one in place, restart the service, and then you'll have your local privilege escalation vector right there from that service running your malicious file. Now, the next thing I would look at is DLL hijacking. Again, this is something that uh, PowerUp should be able to identify as well. So you might not be able to actually modify a service itself, but maybe that service calls some DLL files and you can write to those DLL files and overwrite them. So if you're able to do that, you could hijack the DLL file. So again, you're not changing the service directly, 
but you're you're changing something that the service invokes. So that's another way to get code execution that could lead to local privilege escalation. So another thing you can check for is um, this always install elevated set in the registry. This means that if any MSI files are installed, they'll be installed as administrator. There are ways to abuse this, uh, of course, because you're able to essentially run something as administrator, right? And there are some registry query commands that you can run to see if this is actually set on the machine. Now, the next thing I would look for are scheduled tasks. So uh, scheduled tasks are kind of like cron jobs in Linux, right? It's just a job or you know a task that is running on a set time interval. So when you're looking at this, there's a few different ways to abuse it. We have uh, maybe being able to change the executable file and write to that. So maybe the scheduled task is executing some binary. Maybe we can overwrite that binary. So when the scheduled task goes to run, it actually runs our malicious binary or instead of the intended one, right? Or the same thing, kind of like DLL hijacking. Maybe there's some sort of dependency for the scheduled task that we can overwrite. So I don't know, maybe the um, scheduled task calls another file and we can overwrite that file. Of course, that would lead to code execution and potentially privilege escalation as well. Now, the last thing I would look for in misconfigurations, which could be something that's easy to overlook, but this would be a fairly severe misconfiguration, but it definitely could happen where you have sensitive files being readable. So this is similar to Linux. Again, if you had like Etsy password readable, or sorry, Etsy password writable or Etsy shadow readable, um, you know, you could get the hashes and privilege escalate that way. But in Windows, if you can read from the SAM and system hive, you could pull those registry hives and then you would have all of the local hashes for the machine. And you can go ahead and crack those hashes or maybe even just pass the hash to get right back in since you'll have the NTLM hashes. So I hope this methodology that I use for local privilege escalation on Windows systems helps you in your OSCP journey. If it did, please remember to like and subscribe. And remember, I will leave all sorts of links in the description to help you with actually finding the commands to run uh, for these different steps in privilege escalation. If you can think of anything else that you want me to add to this mind map or flowchart, let me know down below in the comments and I would be happy to update it with your suggestions. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.